Hey everyone, welcome to my kitchen. My name is Jared Myers and today I'm going to show you how I built this butcher block island. So with that being said, let's get into the video. Okay, so in this video, I am not going to show you how to build the island cabinets. Um, I'm going to show you how to build the top and after the island cabinets are put together i went ahead and took some scrap wood i had lying around used a hot glue gun to glue them together uh, so i had a quick and easy template that i could use to plan out how far the overhangs were and also where the oven would sit inside the island Now that I had the templates set up, I realized that the Butcher Block Island would need to consist of three pieces of Butcher Block Island countertop that you could buy from Menards that were uh, 25 inches by eight feet. And I would use these, cut them down and put them together to make my Butcher Block Island top. Okay, so once we got these open, uh, I was checking the edges and I realized that all the edges were beveled, which they should be, uh, but I, to uh, stick the two and the three pieces together, I realized I would have to cut off each side. Uh, but before I did that, I wanted to make sure I had a nice straight edge that I could cut with. So I went ahead and made a straight edge. This straight edge would just serve as a guide with my skill saw to make sure that uh, my cuts did not cut in and out that they stayed as straight as possible so here i'm just cutting off one of the edges um, it, as you can see i'm not taking a whole lot off i just wanted to make sure that edge was straight so when i attached it to the other edge uh, that it met up and it was very hard to tell from the top of the island that uh, i'd stuck more than one piece together all right now that i had the end cut i decided that i need to cut one of the pieces um, in half otherwise my island would be too large then i used my straight edge to finish cutting the edges of the other pieces Okay, so I took my pieces inside and I did a test fit and I realized that my edges weren't completely straight and I had some areas to sand down so they would meet up a little nicer uh, when I glued them together. So this is me just taking a pencil and marking the edges so that way I could sand it flat and uh, just to make sure that it fit nice and tight. Here I just did a test fit uh, with some pipe clamps and right now I'm marking out where I'm going to put all the biscuits. Now the biscuits are put in with this joiner right here and um, it just basically keeps the tabletop from shifting up and down across the surface and just keeps everything level and flat. Uh, so right here you can see that I'm using uh, number 20 biscuit and just doing a quick test and then I'm going to run the rest of them. Now I went ahead and did the other sides of the surfaces that I was going to join together with the biscuit joiner as well. So the biscuit will fit into both sides of the counter and that'll keep it nice and flat. All right, so there you can see the pencil marks where each biscuit goes. And I'm just doing a test fit to make sure everything slides together nice and everything fits. Now that the test fit is finished, um, I'm just standing up the pieces here to go ahead and put glue along the edge and also glue inside of each area where I cut for the biscuit. 
And then I'll use a foam brush to just kind of spread that glue evenly over all of it. Now, while I was doing this, I made quite a mess on the one side. It's best to keep as much as you can off of that, just so you don't have to clean it up, but it will clean up with some water and a sponge. It's not too big of a deal, but it just takes more time. So if you're more careful, like I wasn't, uh, then you won't have as much cleanup. Right now, after I glued the last edge, I went ahead and laid it down and I kept the cardboard pieces along the edges just so that way I didn't mark it up when I used the pipe clamps to pull it all together. Now I have to say that the four pipe clamps was definitely not enough for this large of a countertop. So I later added some ratchet straps as well. I knew that because of the size of this, that I didn't want to just rely on the glue. Uh, so I wanted a mechanical device as well to help hold. So I got these zip bolts or dog bones they're called. So I'm just trying to set up the depth of my bit to make sure I don't drill through the countertop. A good way to set the depth is just to put a piece of tape on the drill bit and as you're drilling don't go past that point. I also picked a router bit that was just a little bit bigger than the shaft of the zip bolt. So it would fit in but there wouldn't be a lot of space. I had eight or nine of these to put into the bottom of the counter and because I didn't want to measure each one out over and over again. I decided to make a template. This template had the two holes in it, and then I also made a straight edge so I could run the router along it and it would go right through the center of each hole. Okay, so now that I got that template cut, I'm gonna just give it a test fit. And the cool thing about these zip bolts is that they're threaded on one side. So as you tighten down one side, it actually pulls the wood together. Now that the test looks good, I went ahead and took the template, positioned it, and started drilling. After I drilled the holes to the proper depth, then I took the router and ran it along my straight edge that I screwed to the bottom of the table. Once that was finished, went ahead and did a test fit and tightened it down. So it looks like this when it's all done. So after I got one to fit, I realized I had about eight more to go. So I decided I would go ahead and stand up the counter so I could work on it vertically and proceeded to drop it. All right, let's see that again. Mm, that hurt. After realizing how extremely lucky I was that nothing was broken, and I was also not hurt, went ahead and continued putting the rest of the zip bolts in. Now that all the bolts were in, did a quick sand to get rid of all the glue and clean everything up. Next I went ahead and cleaned off all the sawdust and then I followed it up with a tack cloth to remove any small pieces and debris to make sure that I sealed it well with Osmo Poly Oil. 
I did quite a bit of research and came across this as kind of the easiest thing to apply and also had the best results for sealing. To go about applying, I got these Scotch-Brite non-abrasive pads, cut them into small pieces, folded them in half, and dipped them in, and applied it to the wood. And with the non-abrasive pads, when you're applying, it actually helps to uh, push down get in there, push the oil into the wood, and it helps smooth out the surface just a little bit more. Once I finished sealing the whole thing, put it, laid it back down, and put my templates on top to see where I needed to cut the hole for the cooktop. Once I had a general idea of where the cuts were gonna be, went and took some painter's tape laid that down first just to protect the surface and then double checked all my measurements against my instructions in the book just to make sure that i wasn't going to mess this cut up if i messed this cut up i could ruin the whole tabletop planned it out drew my straight lines and began cutting After we got a little help from linen, we had to finish cutting the corners, and I used a jigsaw to do that. All right, now that the top is cut, I'm just gonna take this piece of plywood, and this is going to be the bottom of the island. So I'm going to go ahead and plan this out and cut it apart to make sure the cooktop fits and it's cut to the same size as the island cabinets. So you may be wondering why I decided to put plywood underneath the butcher block. Part of the reason was I wanted to put these cantilevered piece of, pieces of metal in between this and the butcher block to help make sure that the butcher block had extra support, especially over where uh, it was gonna be overhanging the counter where people, so that way people could sit and eat at stools. I wanted to make sure if you leaned on the counter that it wasn't going to put too much stress on the butcher block and over time separate and weaken the bonds of glue. So to get this to sandwich between the two layers, I decided I would cut into the plywood just enough to stick my metal pieces inside of it. So with that in mind, all I'm doing right here is just creating a channel in the plywood for the piece of metal to sit. After another quick test fit, you kind of see that uh, it didn't fit flush. So I had to go back with the router and take out the center so it would drop below the plywood or right in line with it. Like this. All right, so next I'm gonna drill the holes for mounting the plywood to the butcher block. Made the holes a little bit larger so that way, if the plywood and the butcher block uh, would grow and shrink in different sizes, that it wouldn't uh, cause stress on the butcher block 
on the glue joints. Also decided to go ahead and put some of the mounting points uh, right through the metal and through the wood just to give them a little more strength on that overhang. After I drilled the holes, I went ahead and put my metal pieces out and sprayed them with some crystal clear mat just to seal them up so they wouldn't rust. Okay, so it's finally time to start attaching the plywood to the island. So this is just me bringing it in very carefully, setting it down. You can see I have the hole cut for the oven um, and then the also places where the metal will slide into them. And I'm just getting it lined up so we can mount it with some screws. And in this case, I just used the leftover Ikea screws that I had, which I had plenty of them uh, from all the cabinets. And I just went through the bottom down here, which is how you're supposed to mount the counter. This is a pretty easy process. Just put the screws through the pre-drilled holes on the metal pieces that went across the top of the cabinets and just make sure it doesn't come through the top of the plywood. And that's all I did. I also put screws in the back side. There's a metal strip that goes through the back. So once I had all those, it's finally time to put, put the butcher block on the island and get it mounted. It's probably better to do this with two people, but if you set yourself up right, you can do a lot of things by yourself. So this is just me sliding it into position. Now I built this whole thing inside and it would have been pretty difficult to bring this in if I would have built it outside. So that's part of the reason why I built it inside just for ease. And that's me pretty excited about it because it finally worked and it was a lot of work. So next was to mount the butcher block to the plywood. And I'm just pre-drilling a hole through the larger holes that I drilled in the plywood a little bit earlier. And then I'm just taking the screw with a washer on it and just tighten it down. Not, not fully tight yet. I wanted to make sure everything was lined up the way I wanted it before I tightened everything down. Then I put in my metal strips that help support the overhang. I had to make sure I put those in while I was mounting it because I had some mounting screws that went through that and into the butcher block. And interesting, um, on the other side, I couldn't run the, the metal pieces far on this one um, because the cooktop got in the way. So I had to go ahead and mark this and cut this down so it would fit because it was a little bit shorter of a length. So I just took the piece of metal out, put it in a vise, used a hacksaw and uh, cut it down to size. Pretty easy. And then I was able to slide it right back in. So I wasn't completely happy with the fit. Um, it was a little bit loose, those metal pieces. I took a little too much off of the router. So I took some uh, leftover butcher block cuttings that I had and cut them down and slid them in there just to tighten up that uh, fit. Then I just continued mounting the countertop. Um, just did a little pre-drill hole right here. Just make sure you don't go through to the top and screw it on. That's how I mounted those. Pretty nice. And there it is, it's on. So next was to go ahead and sand down the surface and the sides. So that way I could apply my stain and sealer. At this point, we decided to skip the stain and we were just going to go with uh, with the sealer by itself and the natural look of the wood. It just looked better. So we decided to, uh, yeah, we just decided we liked it a lot better. So we just stuck with the, the natural look of the wood. You can just see here that I'm just checking the uh, how it looks and making sure everything's straight. Because I put three pieces together, um, you know the the end pieces needed to to look like they were one uniform piece. So I sanded some things down, 
made it all look the same. Just kind of reworking the bevel a little bit. All right, so now that I finished kind of sanding things uh, to make sure that they were level and flat and looked the way that they should and felt the way that they should, it was time to really get things sanded up and ready to apply the sealer. All right, so I think I first started with a 150 grit uh, and sanded the, the whole entire surface and the sides. That's what I'm doing here. It's funny, I thought I would use the hose on the back of the sander, but I actually found that the straight piece on the shop back worked really well to kind of keep things flat and level as I went back and forth. I found that the hose would catch on the end of the edges of the butcher block as you were sanding and it would just be more difficult to use. Uh, so that helped me out a lot. Next, I went to some 180. And I really like this orbital sander uh, with these sanding meshes. They didn't get clogged up as easily. Um, and you know, the more it clogs up, then the more you find yourself uh, sanding with paper that's full of, of sandings, and then you don't actually sand anything. So you just kind of heat the material up and you don't really take anything off. So I found these sanding uh, meshes to be really helpful uh, in giving you a nice even uh, sanding across the whole surface. So again, I'm just using the shop vac with the longer attachment and hose is still there, but uh, that straight piece really made things easier. After that, I think I finished up with a maybe a 320. Uh, and you can kind of pick what you want to do there just till you like the how smooth it is. All right, so after you get this sanded, uh, we're gonna go ahead and seal it up. So I put on my gloves and I've got some non-scratch non Scotch-Brite pads and I've got the Osmo uh, poly oil, give it a nice stir. And I also have some tack claws right here. And you always wanna use the tack cloth to go ahead and get any dust and debris to make sure that that, uh, that seal isn't just sitting on your sandings, it actually gets into the surface. Okay, so here I'm just going ahead using the tack cloth to go over the whole surface. And as I go, sometimes I'll flip it over um, because it's full of debris from sanding. So uh, kind of as you go, just flip it over and uh, so that way you have plenty of clean tackiness to pull all that sawdust and debris off so that way you can seal the seal turns out real nice for you. All right, so now that that's cleaned off, I just went ahead and started applying uh, the sealer with the uh, non-abrasive Scotch-Brite scratch pads and you just kind of dip it in and get a little bit on there and spread it around and work it into the work it into the butcher block. Now, once you go ahead and apply, um, after you put some down, you're going to go back over the whole thing with a dry one and just kind of pick up the dry stuff and spread around the um, the extras that are still there. Just keeps any pooling and everything down, gives you a nice even coat across the whole thing when you go back over it with a dry one. Okay, so you're gonna let that dry overnight. I believe it's eight to 24 hours or something like that. Then you're gonna repeat, repeat the same whole process, uh, even with the tack cloth to make sure there's no dust or debris left over. And uh, then you're gonna go ahead and apply the sealer again, the same way. You lay it down and then you take a dry one and go back over it and you let that sit again for another eight to 24 hours, and then you do it one more time. Okay, so the fumes weren't really that bad, but I just wanted to make sure I was safe. So I went ahead and grabbed one of these that uh, protects you from more than just dust, but also from vapors and fumes. Threw on my gloves and began applying the second coat.
and you wait 8 to 24 hours and then you apply the third coat and this is me applying the third coat again don't be afraid to uh, put some elbow grease in that and push down pretty hard and you know really work it in there it helps just smooth everything out and uh, make sure the stain really and the seal really gets into the wood So once I finally got that done, all the coats on there, I went ahead and trimmed out the bottom where the plywood is. Uh, just because I didn't like the way the side of the plywood looked, I just wanted to put a little white strip trim around there just to finish it off to make it look a little bit nicer. So I'm just cutting some pieces and uh, just uh, using a brad nailer to put those pieces on the edge of the island. All right, so that's it. It is done, finally. Um, so thanks for sticking with me. This is a long video, but I hope it helped people out and figure out you know, some things that might help them build their own. Uh, until next time, leave some comments, some likes, uh, make sure you hit that subscribe button. And uh, until next time, oh, and uh, one more thing. If you have any questions, hit me up down in the comments below and I'll see if I can help you out. And again, until next time,